We have been dealt a hand unlike anything the church has had to contend with for the entire 2,000 years of church history. It has fallen to us now to step up and be the one in your generation. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. Let me tell you a story. I have in my hand a 1800s copy of Blackstone's Common Law. This was the law of the land for England and for America for over 200 years. William Blackstone was an Oxford theologian and judge, and he based his law on the Bible. In fact, there are so many Bible verses in this that a young lawyer named Charles Finney kept running into these Bible references. So to understand the law, Finney had to go out and buy a Bible. <laughs> well, this led to his getting saved, and the rest, as they say, is history. Charles Finney is one of America's greatest voices on revival, and we're going to hear about him later in the program. But I told you this story to make this point. America is not bad or based on corrupt foundations. I'm here to point out even our justice system is founded on scriptural principles. This is part of what makes America different from other nations and freedom to preach the gospel without hindrance. And this is actually the definition of American exceptionalism. We as Christians enjoy more liberties, religious expression than we've had in 60 years as a result of decisions made in the last three years. It's amazing that we don't hear about that stuff. If The court is actually rolling back some of its other secular decisions, and we're becoming a lot more free to express our faith than we've been in 60 years. You have to go back in the 60s to, to see some of the cases that are now rolling back. So there is no secular safe zone in the Bible. I mean, God's involved with everything. And for us to give the notion that, well, take God wherever you go, but this is a secular arena and you don't bring God in this arena. No, no, no. God doesn't stay out of any arena. God's in every aspect of life. But somehow we've got this compartmentalization in our mind. Here's a sermon on religion and patriotism, the constituents of a good soldier. This was a 1755 deployment sermon. By the way, may I point out, I think most Christians in America today are praying for revival. I chose these sermons because every one of these sermons came out of either the first great awakening or the second great awakening. These are all revival sermons. What revival does is show you how to apply the Word of God in a very practical manner, which changes the culture as a result. That's what we're not doing today. We're not addressing a lot of this. And I speak about the church in general, and again, I go back to polling and what we've seen in polling. So military sermons, that was not deployment sermons, whatever it was. We had what were called artillery sermons where we looked at what officers should do. And you remember when John the Baptist was baptizing, he gave specific instructions for soldiers, specific instructions for officers. He addressed the military very clearly. So we used to do that in sermons. Uh, another sermon is this one, the existence of God demonstrated from the works of creation a sermon. That sounds like a creation verse is evolution sermon. That can't be because look at the year, 1795. That would, Darwin was 1859. This is not an issue back in that day. No, it actually was. Um, I've written a number of law school articles and one I wrote for, uh, for law school was on the 75th anniversary of the Scopes trial. Scopes trial is the, the trial they had over evolution in public schools. And it's interesting back in 1925. And it's interesting that it's very easy to prove that everything that Darwin put forth and everything that most evolutionists put forth today was known in the world long before any of that. As a matter of fact, Darwin's not the guy who starts it. At the time of Aristotle, by 500 BC, they already had the primordial slime, the Big Bang, the intermediate species, all, all the major tenets were already established for 500 BC. What Darwin did was he took all of those complicated things and put it together in one book. So his book took all the evolutionary thesis that was out there and put it, he didn't come up with necessarily a new approach to doing things, he just simplified the approach. Now what's interesting is when you look at Darwin and look at what he did, this is the name of his book, The Origin of Species, and that's all you'll see today. If you look it up online, it'll say The Origin of Species. A few editions online say The Origin of Species by means of natural selection. What you will not find in today's books is the rest of his title. Now this is the original, we have an original, and this is what it says. See what it says right there? or the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. Wait a minute, favored races? What are you talking about? Real simple. He goes through and explains, particularly in a book he did a few years later, because the book he did in Origin of Species mainly looked at the evolution of animals. The book he did a few years later on the descent of man 
actually looks at the evolution of man. And what Darwin says is the darker your skin, the less evolved you are. And nearly eight times, he's darker your skin, less evolved, he says. So if we, he was, in for, he was in favor of colonization. If we can send dark skinned people back to Africa and let them stay there until their skin turns light like the rest of us, it'd be perfect to have them come back. That's what he wrote. You want to tell me why we haven't canceled Darwin with all the things we're canceling? I mean, what he said has got to be more offensive than most of the statues that have been torn down. I mean, if you get triggered on something, why don't you get triggered on that? No, we don't. That, that doesn't seem to bother us. We've got to have that in schools. So scientific controversies, we dealt with those back in the day. We, we didn't hedge away from that. We didn't change that. Here's a sermon on the relation of the medical profession to the ministry. We actually dealt with health care. There was a great book that came out in 1961 called None of These Diseases, where a medical doctor in 61 said, you know what? Here's the health care principles of the Bible, and we have studies that show all of these principles are actually right. Nobody knew that 4,000 years ago, but we know it now. That was 61. You ought to see what the evidence is now for how right the Bible was on health care, but we don't even know the health care principles of the Bible, so much in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. We've got a sermon here, The Present Commercial Distress, a sermon uh, preached in, in New Haven Church in this 1837. This is the Second Great Awakening. So the commercial distress, it's dealing with the economic crisis of the Great Depression of 1837. But this is an interesting sermon as well. Character and tendency of the property tax. I haven't heard of many sermons on the property tax. Actually, the Bible deals with all sorts of taxes. It tells you the estate tax is a bad tax, the progressive tax is a bad tax, capitation tax is an okay tax. It tells you what kind of taxes are good and bad. The Bible's very clear on economic policy. Jesus himself in Matthew 20 deals with what we call the minimum wage. He also deals with what we call the, what, what we know as the capital gains tax. Very clearly in Matthew 25, he deals with it. I mean, there's so many tax principles that were done in the Bible that we're just not aware of today. So we covered economic principles out of the pulpit as well. Here's a sermon on the sinful, and pernicious nature of gaming, in other words, gambling. And by the way, this is preached in front of the legislature of Virginia, 1751. This is the First Great Awakening. This is right in the heart of the First Great Awakening. Here's another sermon. This one was the liquor law in Massachusetts, 1852. This is the Second Great Awakening. So we're looking at a law passed in Massachusetts. Uh, here's one on the injustice of the slave trade. This is 1791 at the end of the First Great Awakening, talking about how bad the slave trade is. This is one on marriage, scripturally considered. It's 1837. Uh, New Hampshire just passed a law on marriage. Preacher said, well, here's what New Hampshire just did. Let's see what the Bible says. Is this law a good law or a bad law? Because here's what the Bible says. So we had no difficulty looking at issues. This is one of the great sermons. This is on the Fugitive Slave Law. It's 1851. Probably the worst federal law in American history is the Fugitive Slave Law. I can go into the details. It's an abominable law. And preachers across the United States took to the pulpit and said, Americans, you have to disobey this law. You cannot obey this law because if you do, you're not obeying God. You have to obey God more than man. Acts 4. And this is a law that requires you to have disobedience. So massive civil disobedience as a result of this law, and it was the pulpit who helped organize that civil disobedience. This is where Charles Finney, the great revivalist, was engaged in this type of stuff. He actually required all the students who went to his university, Oberlin, to actively participate in violating that law. If you're going to be a student at that Bible college, you've got to be active in disobeying that law. That's not what we think of today. Yeah, but that's what the revival looked like, Second Great Awakening. So social policy was very common. Uh, here's a sermon, an election sermon. So we dealt with issues like voting. Uh, here's a sermon on preached before John Hancock, Sam Adams. For 170 years, America opened st le state legislative sessions across America were opened with a preacher preaching to the state legislature. As you can see, it's the governor, lieutenant governor, the council, senate, and house of representatives. Whatever the issue was facing the legislature, Texas just went into a special session. If this had been 200 years ago, we would have had a preacher say, now, here's the issues on your call. Here's what the, the call from the governor says we're going to deal with. And here's what the Bible says about those issues. We'd go right through and lay it out. So we talked about government back in the day. There's so many things that we covered out of the pulpit that we just don't anymore. And that's why those old sermons are interesting because they're historical and they show you what we did in times of revival. That in times of revival, we addressed these things very specifically. So why is it that we preached such sermon back in those days? And the answer is very simple. It's found in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That passage says, by all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. By the way, this is where we get the Christian teaching, the Christian doctrine that the Bible, the Word of God, is inerrant, infallible, and, and it's inspired. I mean, and that's, I think that's the most important biblical teaching there is. 
This is the one that tells us the Word of God is true. If the Word of God is not true, then you can't really trust what's in there, and you've got to start picking and choosing what you're going to live by. And that's a terrible place to be. So you start with the assumption that it is inerrant, it's inspired, it's infallible, it is God's word, everything in it is true. That's a super important teaching. However, verse 17 gets very little coverage usually. When we talk about that verse, we don't talk about verse 17. Why did God give us an inspired, inerrant, infallible word? Verse 17 tells us. It says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God gave us his word so that we'd be equipped for every aspect of life. And I would choose the word every there for emphasis because every, I think, is a whole lot bigger in God's vocabulary than it is in ours. And, and you know, what do I mean? How do I prove that? Let me take you back to Genesis 11, thereabouts, when we get introduced to Abraham. Remember Abraham? And from Abraham, we have the two sons, Isaac and Jacob. And from Isaac, we, we move on to his two wives, um, from Isaac and Jacob, you, it, well, I'm getting, all right, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the two wives, and from the two wives, you get the 12 sons, and so there's the 12 tribes of Israel, there's 12 tribes of Israel, you remember what happens is they get ticked at one brother, and so they exclude him, they sell him into slavery, so dad thinks that he's dead, gone, the other 11 brothers know that he's not, but they blot him out of his mind, and then lo and behold, a world famine comes. And this world famine comes and goofs up everything. And while that world famine is coming, Joseph rises from obscurity to a very prominent place. His brothers don't know that. So when the world famine hits, they need food. They go to Egypt with has food, and they end up finding it's their brother that's there. So they get reunited. They take their brother back to dad. Dad's elated, and they get word from the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh says, hey, why don't you just bring your whole family, move in the land of Goshen, stay here with me. I'd love to have your family here. So they move there. They move back to Egypt, and it's a great place to be for a while. And then it turns into a great place of slavery. So for 400 years, there's lots of slavery in Egypt. And after 400 years, God says, I've had it up to here with slavery. And so he sends Charlton Heston to deliver them. So <laughs> Charlton Heston comes and... <laughs> okay, you younger guys may not know what that's about. If you haven't seen the movie, if you haven't seen the movie Ten Commandments, you need to see it. So, so God sends Moses to deliver them, and then there's the deliverance, the, the ten plagues, the, the ten miracles. And then not only is there ten miracles, God ends up wiping out the Egyptians so they have no opposition. He then gives them the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire to lead them to where he wants them to go. And he gets them out to that mountain, which is really significant because at this point in time, they're now out at the mountain. And think what we have here. We have a group of people who have been slaves for 400 years. They think like slaves. They act like slaves. Their mentality is a slave mentality. And God has in his mouth and says, okay, this is really good. Nobody's chasing you. And you don't have a clue where you're going. I have your full attention. And while I've got your attention, here's how it's going to be. And he delivered to them 613 laws there at the mountain. The 613 laws covered every conceivable topic you can think of. That's why we preached about so many things back in those days, because the Bible covered everything that any nation, state, city, anybody else would need to know. And so we looked at the Bible not as just a spiritual book, but we looked at it as a very practical book on living. This is why John Adams at the time said, our pulpits have thundered. I mean, literally it had. He looked, that's why he looked at the preachers and said, these are the guys that caused America to be an independent nation because they showed us how to apply the Word of God to everything that came up, and that's what they tried to do. They weren't perfect. None of us are. They made lots of mistakes, but they made less mistakes than most of the other nations in the world. They tried to get those principles right, and they had the right content coming at them so many occasions. Now, today, we have certainly had a change in America. Why is that? Part of it is because we don't know the Bible very well. Currently, right now, only 9% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. Only 6% have a biblical worldview. It is very hard to think biblically if you don't know what the Bible says. And that's what we face today. Most people cannot tell you what the Bible says about economics because they haven't read the Bible. With only 6%, that's one out of 16 Americans, think the way that God thinks on the issues God talks about in the Bible. God gives us positions on all these, and most Christians are not where God is on the issues he's talked about. And so we just assume that I'm a Christian, God loves me, and whatever I believe, that's what God believes too. No, 
we're supposed to be conformed to his image, and that takes effort and work. Jesus said, if you don't crucify yourself every day, you can't be my disciple. you got to be putting yourself aside. It's not about you. It's about you throwing in the tank like me. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, known through the scriptures it goes. So this is the problem we face. Now, the change really occurred. That what happened was the way we looked at the Great Commission. Uh, the Great Commission, you remember, is in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus told the, the apostles, the disciples, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. So what happened was in the 60s, 1960s, we took the Great Commission and we turned it into an evangelism mandate. In other words, God wants you saved, I'm going to get you saved. And that's not bad. I mean, that we know all the way back to Proverbs 10, 28, that he that wins souls is wise. We're supposed to be bringing people to the Lord. But that's not what the Great Commission is about. He said, go make disciples of all people. It's about discipleship, not evangelism. Not that evangelism is bad, but it is about discipleship, and that's the key thing. He said, you teach them everything I've taught you. Now, let me give you an example. If we were into teaching people the teachings of Jesus, it'd be a whole lot more than just how to get saved. Uh, for example, if I take this everything, let me, let me just remind you of some of the teachings of Jesus. Let's start right up top with Matthew 19, no-fault divorce. Jesus gave 15 verses on how bad no-fault divorce was. Now, granted, our nation has had no-fault divorce since 1968. That's the first no-fault divorce law passed in America. Prior to 1968, if you wanted a divorce, particularly, particularly back in the founding era, you had to get an act of the legislature to dissolve your marriage. You had to get the legislature to say, okay, We'll let you guys be divorced, and it had to be for biblical reasons. There's about half a dozen causes biblically. Well, Jesus had given this teaching to his disciples, and he said, hey, and Peter, Peter kind of starts us off. He says, you know, Moses allowed us a bill of divorcement. We had no-fault divorce. Moses said we could divorce our wife for any reason. And Jesus said it wasn't that way. That's not what God designed. He said, don't you remember at the beginning? He said, God made them male and female, and whatever God has joined together, not man put asunder. And Peter said, what? No, no-fault divorce? That's a really hard teaching. Jesus put it right in the face of his disciples. See, people don't talk about it today because we might offend somebody because there's a lot of divorce in the church today. As a matter of fact, 87% of Americans who have gotten divorced got divorced after they made a commitment to Christ, which is just a phenomenal statistic. Born-again Christians have a higher divorce rate in America than atheists do, than non-born-again non Christians. Born-again Christians have the highest divorce rate in the United States today, and 87% of those born-again Christians got divorced after they became born again. So even back then, he's telling the disciples, no, 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 you're not thinking right about this. So Jesus has a long teaching, and it was a hard teaching even for his disciples. His disciples, Peter complained about it. He said, Lord, this is a hard teaching. I said, can't help it. That's the way God did it. So that's part of discipleship, is teaching him everything that he taught us. Remember other things that he taught, for example, in Luke 19, rewarding profit makers. If you remember that, Luke 19, you had the, the parable where he called the servants together and gave each one a mina. Mina is defined as a specific amount of money. And that day, compared to today, it's worth about $10,000 a day. He said, you guys take this and you invest it and I'll check with you when I get back. And so later when he comes back, he said, what'd you do with that 10,000 I gave you, that mina I gave you? First guy said, I've known you, you are a hard guy. And you just don't seem to be very fair. And so I didn't do anything with it. And he looked at him and said, you didn't even put it in the bank to make interest on it in the bank? I didn't do anything. Okay, we'll come back to you later. What'd you do with it? Well, I took the 10 and I made 50. Uh, I made five times as much. I got 50,000 here for you. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. I'll make you rule over five cities. By the way, not many Christians consider that be a reward for being faithful is being put in civil government. Notice what Jesus said. You've been really good with what I gave you. I'm going to put you in civil government. You can be rulers over five cities. The next guy, he said, what'd you do? Well, I made 10 times as much. Great, I'm going to make you a ruler over 10 cities. The more faithful you are to what God wants, the more you need to be in leadership in the civil arena. That's not the way we think. That's what he's talking about. But then he comes back and says, now, he said, you guys go take away from the guy who, who didn't do anything with his and give it to the guy who had 10. And they go, whoa, Jesus. You can't do that. I mean, the guy's already got 10. And they're thinking more like socialist, which is 10 and 5. That's 15. 1 is 16 divided by 3. Everybody should get 5. And that's kind of the thinking. Don't give to the one who's got 10. He's got too much. And Jesus says, no, to him who has and will be given. To him who has not will be taken away even that which he has. If you can't be productive, I'm not going to reward you. 
the more productive you are, the more I'm going to reward you. That is not socialism. That is free market capitalism. And this deal about saying, I'm going to reward you. See, the capital gains tax says the more profit you make, the more we're going to take away from you. If you're a business and make profit, we're going to hit you harder. Jesus says, if you make profit, I'm going to keep pouring it to you. I'm going to take from the guy who's not profit. See, Jesus doesn't reward unprofitable. He rewards the profitable and keeps it going. He doesn't penalize them. So that's our capital gains tax. That whole tax system is built on penalizing those who are productive. That's not the way it should go. You also have what Jesus did in Matthew 20, opposition to minimum wage. Matthew 20, particularly verse 15, where he says, it's not my money, mine to do with it, I please. It is not. You will pay this guy 15 an hour and this one what I... I own multiple businesses, and I can't even decide whether my employees are salaried or not. The government tells me what categories I can pay a salaried employee, what categories are an hourly employee. It's up to me and my employee. That's what Jesus has on employer-employee contracts. Whatever the employer and employee agree to, that is the contract under which that employee operates. And as Jesus pointed out, th throughout the day, he had four different groups, and he, had, he made a different contract with each group of workers, and it was different from the one before. And, he said, and they said, well, wait, we won't already everybody else got. No, you agreed to work under this contract, and that's what you're going to work under. He just points out, I give you four different contracts. Each one's different from the others. Whatever you agree to as an employee, that's the contract we have. Now. So you have the right to negotiate a, a contract. Now the government's going to tell you what your contracts are, whether your people are going to be hired or salaried, what level, whether they're limited uh, salary. It's just crazy what we have to put up with. And the final one, John 8, the right of legal confrontation. We're told by the U.S., um, if you practice federal law, Federal Practice and Procedure, Volume 30, points out very clearly that every one of the due process rights in the Bill of Rights came out of the Bible. They point to John 8.10 as the right to confront your accuser, going back to what Jesus did at that point in time. Uh, the right to have, the right to compel witnesses on our behalf comes out of Proverbs 18.17. There's so much of our legal code that came out of the scriptures, and even federal practice procedure today still acknowledges the biblical origin of that. Most people don't know that today, they think law is secular. So all that to say is when you look back then, we address biblical relevancy. So how about today? Where are we now? Well, interestingly, when you look at America right now, in the last 20 years, the percentage of Christians in America has fallen by 20%. In the last 40 years, the percentage of Christians in America has fallen by 35%. So we are on a plummeting downward turn with Christianity and in polling and asking people, why are you leaving the church? It's interesting, two out of three people who leave the church say they leave it because they find no relevancy in church. They're looking for very specific ways on how to live their life. And I'll tell you, I tell preachers all the time, uh, guys, I, I can't come to your church. It's real simple. I don't need to get saved 52 times a year. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I need to know what, what I'm supposed to do at McDonald's on Tuesday morning, what I got to do at, at Home Depot. I need some practical stuff. I don't need to say a sinner's prayer er, every week. And by the way, may I point out something? It's not shepherds that reproduce sheep. It's sheep that reproduce sheep. If, if, she, if you need to come to church and get saved. No, you don't. No, you need to get saved by another sheep who leads you to the Lord. If shepherds are reproducing sheep, there's something weird going on in the barnyard, just real frankly. That's, that's not the way it goes. If you have a healthy, look, I raise sheep. I'm in the country, got sheep, horses, all the stuff. If you raise sheep and your sheep are healthy, sheep reproduce sheep. The shepherd is the one who makes sure they have their nutrients and their care and their make sure they're in good shape. Healthy congregations reproduce more. It's not the pastor that does so. And we're in this thing now, if you need to come to church and hear, no, you don't. Jesus didn't say come, he said go. He said you go out there and you make disciples. So we've got this mentality all wrong on that. So sorry about that, you got real pointed, that's the way it is in the country. So back to things at hand. All of these things today are issues that we deal with and we face, and very few do we hear from any church, any pulpit, any Christian. They're the issues of the day, and the Bible speaks to every one of them. They're not what we're addressing. So close this thing out. I'm going to go to Charles Finney. I mentioned him earlier. Charles Finney is probably the most notable name of the Second Great Awakening. Charles Finney, a revivalist, he, it's estimated in one year he led more than 100,000 people to Christ in one year. Just unbelievable what he did. And this is what he told the church leaders in his day. He told them very simply, he said, brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. He says, if immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours in a large degree. 
He continues and says, if there's a decay of conscience, the pulpit's responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. He said, if the world loses its interest in religion, here we are today, plummeting numbers, the pulpit is responsible for it. He says, if Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit's responsible for it. He says, if our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit's responsible for it. He didn't blame secular people for nothing. He blamed church people for everything. This is powerful. Charles Finney held Friday night meetings on how to birth revivals and awakenings. Finney said this, Brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours to a great degree. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. He didn't blame secular people for anything. He held the church responsible for everything. He finished by saying, let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us hear and be thoroughly awakened to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. He taught that we have to get involved in the civil arena, that revival is actually a science, and there are certain things you can do to bring revival to the land. We know the verse where we humble ourselves and pray. He also said politics are part of a man's faith walk. Christians must do their duty to their country as a part of their duty to God. We will find blessing or cursing according to the course Christians take in politics. These ideas are directly from his revival lesson entitled, Hindrances to Revivals. A hindrance is not getting involved in culture, is not getting involved in things outside the church doors. He said if we enter into the area of hindrances, we can pray all day long and not see revival. This is from a guy who saw 100,000 people born again in one year. In 1835, he wrote, a revival is not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense. He said, do what is right and you will see revival happen. This is what Jesus was saying when he talked about salt and light. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.